our uh, delegates. I am delighted uh, uh, to be able to welcome you to the 11th um, event of the CREC on the web uh, today. And uh, uh, this, these have all been focused uh, largely on the ethical challenges that have emerged as we battle against the pandemic in these past few months. Uh, so we'll be talking about this uh, in a bit, but before we do that, I would like uh, to move to the uh, main room um, where we have a little celebration. And uh, the celebration is because today, CBEC has turned 17. On 8th October, 2004, our mothership, and its director took a leap of faith in one direction and Dr. Mozam was in the other direction, leaping <laughs> with the same faith and they met. And uh, we had CBEC. So this is the first center of bioethics to have emerged in the country uh, where the institution actually put their money where their mouth was. Uh, so instead of just talking about ethical practices, we now had a center which was actually promoting um, ethics education and ethics research, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been 17 years and there's been no looking back. Uh, we've had uh, uh, in the past uh, several uh, successes, including the fact that we are now uh, since 2017, uh, a WHO collaborating center for bioethics also. We were the first one in the Amro region. Now there are a couple of more, but we were the first. So we've been very fortunate to have had the unwavering support of Professor Adib Rizvi, the director of SIUT, as I said, who was willing to put his uh, money where his mouth was um, and commit uh, walk the talk. Uh, and of course, the vision of Dr. Mozam, uh, the founding chair of CBEC, uh, to move us towards our directions and to gain national and uh, uh, significant global recognition. So even though Dr. Mozam is on sabbatical, I don't think she could have resisted uh, uh, the pull of this uh, webinar today. So welcome Dr. Mozam also and uh, the rest of the group. Um, you can see a little celebration going on. Uh, we have uh, uh, in our main room, Michelle, Swaleha, Loretta, uh, we have um, Ali right there in the white lab coat, we have Anika, uh, Farid, uh, Shahzad, uh, and our newest uh, uh, member of the family, which is uh, Mr. Ibrahim, the young gentleman in Swaleha's uh, lap, who, becomes, uh, who makes sure that his mother comes to work every day. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah, so that's that's the only way we can make sure. The uh, so there is a tiny little cake in this very 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 large um, table, but uh, the, the, that's all that we are permitted to eat. Uh, we are very health conscious. So okay, like getting back uh, to business, I think uh, uh, moving back to our goal for today. So um, uh, our event today is actually a, a sixth in the series of webinars we've had on focusing only on the ethical dilemmas that emerged throughout this pandemic. So we started off earlier on when uh, in 2020, when uh, initial research started and we were looking at the quagmire of COVID-19 research, but looking at the focus, focusing on uh, uh, the subcontinent. So that was the very first webinar. Then we went on to uh, broaden our focus to all uh, low and middle income countries and Dr. Uh, Moodley, who is one of our panelists today, actually uh, was leading a seminar at that time for us also. Um, mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, we explored the very fine, delicate balance between research and therapy that was actually many times blurred during the COVID uh, research uh, phase, initially at least. And we looked at it through the MURI framework uh, and Dr. Andreas from WHO was leading that. Uh, data privacy has been a major issue uh, as we have battled uh, and put on various uh, public health measures to battle the, the pandemic. Uh, with many dashboards appearing and, and not knowing where the limits of privacy are and where privacy uh, can be breached, et cetera, uh, or confidentiality can be breached. Um, uh, Natasha has been a, a passionate, uh, 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 has been very passionate about this and she led this seminar for us. Then, um, then came the vaccines. And of course, the question of whether it was an obligation or whether it was in, left to individual choice. Dr. Fessel was actually one of the panelists in that particular webinar. Um, that brought us to the newest possible dilemma that, that has emerged, which is about the boosters. So COVID-19 uh, vaccine boosters, the data, 
and the dilemma, which is today's focus. Um, so this is not where it ends. In a couple of weeks time, we'll be having actually our hybrid workshop and ethical uh, ethics during public health emergencies. And at the end of that, we have a, this is a three day uh, hybrid workshop. We're having a, another uh, uh, public event uh, on the web, uh, public health ethics, uh, public health challenges in COVID-19 vaccines and beyond. So that will be the next one, which will be uh, uh, publicizing. For, but for today's uh, webinar, we have an excellent team, as I mentioned, and I'll just in, briefly introduce uh, all of our panelists to you. So Dr. Sayed Faisal Mahmood uh, is, uh, well, is quite a celebrity in Pakistan now. He is an associate professor in the Department of Infectious Diseases at the Khan University in Pakistan. He graduated from the same university and specialized in uh, uh, his uh, internal medicine and uh, infectious diseases from the US. So Dr. Faisal has the um, um, uh, distinction, I should say, of being the first physician in Pakistan to have managed the first patient who, have diagnosed, who, who was diagnosed with COVID-19 back in February to 2020. Uh, so he's been a trailblazer in that sense. But he has been deeply involved in clinical on the clinical front, but not only that, he's also an avid researcher and he's been researching various aspects of COVID-19 uh, uh, therapeutics as well as um, um, vaccines. Uh, he's also been involved at the policy level with the uh, health uh, authorities of the province uh, and has been recognized by the government of Pakistan by uh, honoring him with a Tamgha Imtiaz, a um, medal of distinction, um, which was uh, uh, awarded to him just recently in recognition of his work. So uh, uh, the second speaker would be Dr. Uh, Kimantri Kiman Moodley. Uh, Dr. Moodley is a professor uh, in the Department of Medicine and the director of the Center of, for Medical Ethics and Law. Uh, Faculty of Health Sciences, Stellenbosch University, South Africa. This is also a WHO collaborating center of bioethics and was uh, redesignated uh, in 2019. In 2017, Dr. Moodley was uh, appointed as a junk professor in the Department of Social Medicine, University of Northern Carolina, Chapel Hill, USA. Uh, she's actually a practicing specialist family physician and a bioethicist and a researcher and is, has been a principal investigator on many, many uh, clinical trials for the past decade and more. She's a member of several uh, research councils across the world and uh, several uh, 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 agencies that are dealing with uh, ethics and research. Uh, third speaker is Dr. Sunil Kumar Dudani. Dr. Dudani is uh, currently working as an associate professor in infectious diseases in the department of uh, uh, infectious diseases at the Sin Institute of Urology and Transplantation. Uh, he has done his fellowship in internal medicine from the Dow University of Health Sciences, and then he did his infectious diseases training at SIUTV and he now is faculty. He's been a key person in the transformation of SIUT, which is primarily a um, transplant institute, and converting it in transforming it into 2020 into a specialized COVID hospital. Uh, so he's been a key player in that. Uh, he's uh, also been involved at the national level in developing uh, guidelines for management of COVID-19. He was a recipient of Young Investigator Award uh, in the Congress of Asian Society of Transplantation recently in 2021. Our fourth speaker is uh, Dr. Faiza Jahan. Faiza Jahan is the uh, chairperson uh, in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health and is an associate professor at the Aarhan University in Karachi, Pakistan. She graduated uh, uh, from the same university, the AKU, uh, so, and has, is also an alumnus uh, with a master's in epidemiology and biostatistics from AKU. So Dr. Jaha is a, um, a member of the Infectious Disease Society of Pakistan in the Pakistan Pediatric Association and the Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, in addition to serving as a member of the International Society of Infectious Diseases. Her research and in, uh, interests include uh, maternal, newborn, and child health nutrition, vaccines, and uh, preventable illnesses, among many other areas. Uh, she is recently been the uh, recipient of the Outstanding Senior Faculty Researcher Award at the 12th Health Sciences Research Assembly of the Aarhus University. So before I hand over to Natasha, I also want to um, introduce her. So Dr. Natasha Anwar is a consultant consultant molecular biologist at the Aarhus University lab in Lahore. But for us, much more importantly, she is a CBEC veteran. 
She is a P has a postgraduate diploma in biomedical ethics from our center, and then a master's in bio bioethics again from our center, and is now an associate faculty of CBEC, and a very passionate uh, 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 member of our, our our faculty with very strong views about the social aspects of the public health measures being taken in the COVID uh, uh, battle against COVID. So, before I hand over to Natasha, just a few. Uh, uh, broad over, um, uh, rules. So they, they, there are four speakers today, as we know. Each of uh, the speakers will have about 12 to 14, 15 minutes to speak. And after the four talks are over, we will have about 20 to 30 minutes for a general discussion with all the four discussants. So the uh, people in the audience uh, can, uh, first of all, request you to keep their, mi um, their mics on mute so that the speakers are not disturbed. But you can have your videos on if you want. You, uh, the speaker, the uh, and the uh, audience members can put in their questions in the chat box uh, uh, on Zoom, or they can do so if they are on Facebook Live. They can do so in the comments box. We'll be monitoring them and feeding all the questions to uh, Dr. Natasha, who will then put them up uh, to the panelists and the question and answer session. So over to you, uh, Natasha. Thank you very much, Dr. Amir, and a very happy birthday to CBEC. Um, I wish I could be there in person to have some of that cake, but I think that's, um, you owe me cake, okay? Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be moderating this afternoon. I'm so grateful to our distinguished panel for taking time out and um, you know, being part of, of this discussion today. And welcome to our audience who is joining us from Facebook and through Zoom. Um, I'm just going to start off by setting a little bit of a stage of um, what, uh, you know, what, just to set the context and just to find out exactly what is going on in terms of our understanding of boosters currently and uh, where we stand in terms of, um, sorry, just trying to switch this on, where we stand in terms of our uh, of, of different countries, their position on boosters, whether boosters are actually required or not. Um, so, let, so I'll just start with this particular statement. Um, okay, it's not starting. Oh, here it is. Okay. So this is a moral indictment of the state of our world. It is an obscenity. We pass the science test, but we are getting an F in ethics. I mean, it's pretty strong words, and they are the words of this gentleman, who is the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. Um, and he only just made this statement a few weeks ago at, at the UN General Assembly. Again, very disappointed about um, how the rollout of vaccines um, globally has really not been a very just or equitable. So lots of things going on in, in the media in terms of booster vaccines. Um, there are questions being asked, do we actually need booster shots? Um, different countries are approving booster doses for different groups and different vulnerable populations. Uh, we've got also um, some, uh, some uncertainty about whether or not additional, an additional dose will cause any other kind of reaction. So, trying to get onto my screen. Um, again, Israel has uh, made COVID booster shots mandatory for its population. Um, but again, logistically, handling booster shots in a number of countries has, has sort of created a bit of an issue in that hospitals are now overrun with people wanting booster shots, and they haven't even actually rolled out the second doses to, to a lot of uh, individuals. And as a result of this, as a result of a lot of the uncertainty that's been going on globally, um, the WHO actually issued an interim statement three days ago, and we'll be coming back to that a little later. But um, really, the booster discussion has, um, you know, a, it, it's really kind of gotten us to think about some of the issues here. There are a number of dilemmas. There's a dilemma about the science. You know, do we understand it well enough? Have we actually looked at it closely enough? There are, there are issues of justice and there are serious issues of equity. So today, this afternoon, what we're hoping to do during this session is to try and get a little bit of an idea about the current data that supports um, uh, the, the, the need and the requirement for, for uh, a third dose. 
So once bitten, twice shy, third time lucky, as Dr. Fessel is going to be presenting that um, to kick us off. After that, we've got Professor Moodley. She's going to be talking about the importance of providing global coverage of COVID-19 vaccines. And again, um, you know, she's going to focus um, from the perspective of South Africa, that's where she is, and their experience with the, with the, uh, the rollout of the vaccine um, in South Africa. And then we have Dr. Sunil, who's going to talk about boosting health equity or health equality. Again, looking at whether or not um, we can justify uh, providing booster doses for vulnerable, group, vulnerable groups like healthcare workers, the elderly and immunocompromised. And then um, we've got towards the end, a little bit of a discussion about children and whether or not children should get the COVID vaccine. And Dr. Pfizer is hopefully going to enlighten us a little bit. I mean, we haven't had, uh, there hasn't been too much of a discussion about you know, vaccinating children in Pakistan. So this will be really nice to hear um, you know, her experience and, and, and what she has to share. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to ask Dr. Fessel to, to kick us off uh, this afternoon. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, I changed the, the thing, uh, the title a little bit. Uh, Natasha, I'm sorry about that. Um, I just couldn't remember which what the title was, so I just wrote this up, um, which was uh, to boost or not to boost and what's the science. And, 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 and truly just um, not looking at the other aspects, but just what the science is. Um, and, you know, if you ask anybody at this point, should we get a booster? Um, the answer is, is yes. That's what everybody says. And, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Um, but, but but wait, there, there, there's there's more, and 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 this is what um, you sort of want to want to put out there is that if it's not a simple yes or no answer um, when you talk about uh, should you get a, a booster or not because um, and and before we even talk about boosters or not, I think it's important that we're all on the same page about what are some of the terms that we use when you talk about boosters and revaccination and efficacy because without understanding that, it's hard to understand um, if no one needs a booster or not. So remember, a booster essentially means giving a vaccine after somebody has been completely uh, vaccinated. So they finish the whole vaccine series and they get another um, uh, dose. And the reason really is to bring back the immunity back to an acceptable level, uh, which assumes that the immunity had dropped um, to an unacceptable level. And therefore, you're bringing it back again. And you do this by increasing the memory cells and by increasing the avidity. So the, you're, you're, you're actually retraining the body and the antibodies um, actually are even better at binding with whatever um, you're binding against, but in this case, the virus. This is different from giving additional doses. Uh, additional doses essentially is giving more doses in a vaccine series than what's usually given. So if somebody, um, and this usually you give for people with low immunity. So if somebody has low immunity, you give them two doses and you know that two doses for this person won't be enough. So you give them three doses um, because they will not respond to a, a two dose vaccine. And this is different from revaccination, um, which is something very uh, uh, typical or, or actually topical um, in, in this part of the world, which is giving revaccinating somebody with a completely new vaccine series. And this is done mostly for logistic reasons. So if, for example, I have gotten Sinopharm and Sinopharm is not accepted in, um, in a given country uh, and they only accept Pfizer. So then what? Uh, um, then you would revaccinate me with Pfizer just so that I can travel. It has nothing to do with my immunity um, uh, or, or to make me more protected or if I that, that I didn't make uh, antibodies initially, uh, excuse me, or not. The other thing is vaccine efficacy. What does that mean? So vaccine efficacy really is something that you do based on clinical trials. Um, uh, and, um, and it's really a carefully selected patients in, in, in controlled conditions who you're following up every day um, or, every, or, or every week or every month and to see if they have symptoms or not um, in, in a set protocol. So this is sort of like, like a really like a, a closed experiment in many ways where half people get the vaccine and half don't, don't and you follow them uh, up ahead. Um, this is different from vaccine effectiveness, uh, which is more real-life data. So once you deploy the vaccine, you look at observational studies and you see um, uh, how, um, you know, how well the vaccine is working. And this is different from the efficacy. And the numbers are always often lower because A, you have a large variety of patients. Over here, you have you know, patients with all sorts of different uh, problems, um, uh, which may affect how well the vaccine works. There are design issues in these studies uh, because depending on how you select your patients, you may have introduce biases. And also it takes into account the on-ground on realities, cold storage, and did the patients come on time? Did the patients get the vaccine early? Did the patient get the second dose and so on and so forth? Um, and then uh, uh, finally, when you talk about the vaccine effectiveness or efficacy, and I say the vac vaccine eff effectiveness is 75%, 
you know, um, a lot of people don't realize what this means. Does this mean that there's a 75% chance this vaccine will work on me? Does it mean there's a 75% chance, um, sorry, that it'll prevent 75% of infections um, of COVID-19 or 75% of admissions or 75% of that of people dying? Or does it even mean that 75% less people will get COVID-19 or get admitted or die? Um, so so, um, so th these terms are not so straightforward, um, really. And just to understand uh, a little bit, uh, in a, in, if you're looking at efficacy, um, uh, you'll have a placebo group uh, who got the vaccine, you'll have a vaccine group who got the, sorry, a placebo group who did not get the vaccine, and the vaccine group who got the vaccine, um, and then you follow them along, and, you know, of the placebo group, five people probably may, maybe died of the 20, uh, and the vaccine group, um, one person died of the 20. So essentially 25% people died in placebo, 5% died in vaccine, and the efficacy is 25 minus 5 divided by 25. So in other words, 80% um, less people died in the vaccine group, and that's what um, uh, this is. But keep in mind, this red man can be death, maybe severe disease, maybe infection. So when you're saying eff eff efficacy or effectiveness, you have to say for what? Um, before you, uh, you you go forward, and and keep in mind again that you know the same thing could um, you, uh, uh, if you the blocks maybe people who got the infection as opposed to a died, and in this case the efficacy is only twenty percent for infection, but it was remember eighty percent for uh, for death. So 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 they're they're they're, they're different things. And the last thing about the background is keep in mind that we have a number of vaccines, uh, the inactivated Sinovac, Sinopharm, the, the recombinant um, viral vectors, that's AstraZeneca, Cancino, um, uh, uh, Johnson, Johnson, and then uh, Sputnik, and then the mRNA, Moderna and Pfizer. Just a reminder, because these names are going to come over and over again. So uh, coming back to do we need a booster? So uh, do we need a booster will depend on how long the vaccine lasts. And in other words, you're asking, me, um, how does the immune system wane or not? Does the response decrease or not? And uh, if, if it does decrease, does this mean that the efficacy uh, of the vaccine also drops? Um, and does this mean that the effectiveness also uh, drops? And let's look at some of the data surrounding this, and then we can come to a decision in the next maybe 10 minutes. Um, so does the immune response drop or not? So if you look at the B cell, the antibody response, so, and, and again, there's a huge variety of, of papers here. So I'm just going to give you one or two just to give you a flavor of what's out there. Um, uh, one study by Brian looked at uh, healthcare worker antibody post the Pfizer vaccine. And what he's found was a significant drop in the antibody levels um, uh, uh, down, uh, down up to day 180. Zero negative means they the, these folks never got COVID. Zero positive means that these folks had gotten COVID and then the vaccine. And in both cases, um, the, the, the antibody levels dropped. Um, significantly um, after uh, at about 180 days. Um, uh, Shurthi, and this was recently studied in, uh, uh, published in Lancet, looked at the same um, with Pfizer and AstraZeneca in, in the UK and found that the, the, in, in the AstraZeneca, there was a five-fold reduction in the antibody level. Um, and with Pfizer, there was about a two-fold level um, uh, uh, drop in the antibody levels at day 70. And again, uh, statistically significant uh, in this case. So antibody levels definitely drop. And when you look at the T cell response, they're mixed, but uh, maybe we also see that antibody, uh, that the, uh, the, the response does uh, drop to some degree um, in, in some studies. And hence, we should all panic and run and go get the, the, the booster right now. But there is always a but in science. So, but uh, remember, um, uh, the antibody levels are expected to drop um, after uh, any infection or vaccine because our body won't keep making antibodies. Um, and memory cells will continue to develop and mature um, as time goes uh, goes by. And this one preprint from Goal um, showed, looked at the memory cells after vaccination um, and looked at many things. But one of these things, for example, was looking at the memory cells against the spike protein. And you can see over here, um, as time went by, the first box, um, the, 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 the memory cells making the IgG actually increased. So you had... Um, by six months, you not only had um, still had memory cells, but the memory cells actually continue to develop and continue to improve um, with, with time. So, so the antibody levels drop. Um, memory cells maybe don't drop. T cells maybe do or not don't drop. But does this make a difference to the eff efficacy? So we have limited data on efficacy. Remember from clinical trials, um, there is one um, uh, six-month data uh, by Pfizer, uh, and that was from by uh, Thomas and NEGM. Um, and what they, uh, and in this case, the endpoint was symptomatic disease um, and severity. And this is what they showed. So um, over here, um, you have the number of people with uh, with with uh, uh, infection, and the blue um, are a placebo, and the red is those who got the Pfizer vaccine. And you can see over time the number of people who got uh, an infection sort of kept going up slightly. 
And if you look at these uh, boxes, apologies for people on the phone who may be looking at this, but at two months, um, you can see that the, the, the vaccine efficacy was about 90%. And beyond four months, the vaccine e efficacy dropped a tad bit to about 83.7%. Not a huge lot, but it did drop um, a, a little bit. Um, how about uh, the effectiveness? Um, so in other words, real life data. So if you look at uh, Goldberg, and um, this is a preprint, the reason I picked this up is this is, this is the big Israeli national data where a lot of the booster things um, uh, come up and they looked at 4.7 million people who were vaccinated and looked at rates only in July um, and, uh, and, and compared it to when the person got vaccinated. And here I want you to look at the last set of bars um, and just to go let, uh, have you go through this the first bar the, the dark brown one, dark black one are people who got um, over 60 who got vaccinated in January and we're looking at the rates of COVID per thousand which was about three point something um, uh, uh, in July so this is infections in July so people who got back uh, so the earlier you got vaccinated the more infections you uh, likely you were to get an infection um, in July um, uh, while those who got vaccinated in March um, uh, actually, there were fewer, the incidence of infections was lower um, in, in that group at uh, in the 60 plus. Um, uh, and the same sort of similar finding in, in younger age groups. Um, similarly, um, I, I, uh, this is from Qatar, um, uh, where uh, they looked at about a million or odd vaccinated individuals, and they looked at the effectiveness, again, this was Pfizer, um, and the effectiveness at uh, one month post uh, vaccination right over here was 77%. While um, uh, beyond uh, seven months, it was about 22% uh, effectiveness of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, so the effectiveness um, does drop uh, with time. Um, and the question then is, why does the effectiveness drop? Um, and obviously, um, oh, sorry, before that, um, when you look at effectiveness for severe disease, we looked at infection. So there's a preprint from Andrew looking at in the data from England where they had about 1.4 million individuals. And you can see for both AstraZeneca and Pfizer, uh, in the age more than 65, the top two graphs, you can see that the effectiveness uh, for severe disease also dropped, not a huge lot. Uh, so we're looking at here at about a uh, about 90% for severe disease at um, at about two weeks uh, to, to two months, and about at 20 weeks we're still at about 80%. So it does it's still fairly effective, but it does drop uh, uh, with time. And then so that brings us to the question that why does it uh, drop? And the, the the really the 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 first thing that comes to mind is it's probably the waning immunity. The immunity level is dropping, but there are many other reasons why this uh, effectiveness could drop. One is the variants. We know that a lot of this um, data that uh, with the dropping is with is when Delta variant was sort of rampant, and we and um, uh, and as with Delta and some of the other variants, um, the vaccine efficacy actually is lower. Uh, the vaccine doesn't work so well. There's a there may be a change in behavior. So people who um, got vaccinated may be behaving differently. We know that in Israel and in England, both cases uh, around this time, there was uh, a, a decrease in the non-pharmacological intervention, so masking, et cetera, which puts these people at more risk of getting the infection. There were also maybe people who got the vaccine are probably more likely to get uh, uh, tested and therefore get picked up in this net. Um, and also remember, um, uh, the initial vaccines were given to those who were more vulnerable um, uh, earlier. Um, so therefore, uh, these folks are more are less likely to develop a robust immune um, response. In other words, more likely to get the infection anyway. So hence, now uh, they, they're the ones who are going to see more breakthrough infections in. So um, uh, so wrapping it up, uh, the question then becomes, do we need a booster? Um, so does the vaccine efficacy win? Not really in the short term, not by much. But does the effect effectiveness win? Yes, it does. But there may be multiple factors for this. And does the immune response win? Um, and yes, it does. But we're not sure what this means, how um, much is a, a reduction is, is important. And that brings me to almost my last slide, which is, um, uh, and, and what about our local vaccines um, and how does this relate to it, which is we don't have, you know, so I mentioned AstraZeneca, I mentioned Pfizer, but we don't have much on our local inactivated Sinopharm and Sinovac, and we don't have these big studies uh, to help guide us what needs to be done next. We do know that higher titers will give you more protection against infection, um, uh, but you need lower titers for uh, a protection against severity of disease. And with these inactivated vaccines, you have you develop not as many antibodies as you do with the mRNAs. Um, and we also know that the higher the titer you start off with, the longer the protection lasts. And this modeling um, over here shows the top bar that if your efficacy was about 70% to begin with, your efficacy uh, will drop over time at 250 um, days, you will be much lower than if your efficacy had started off with 90%, the second bar. And if you look at the second bar, um, second box, which is uh, the need for a booster, if your efficacy started at about 70%, um, uh, percent, 
um, efficacy when you uh, so, uh, when you start off with, then you know you would drop to an efficacy of fifty percent at about one fifty days. While if you start at ninety percent, um, you will drop to an efficacy of about at about two hundred days. And then the variance also will will play a part uh, over here um, in it. So it's possible that for the inactivated vaccines, we probably do need a booster earlier than mRNA vaccine. So uh, and then and then obviously vaccines are safe. Early data shows that um, uh, in Israel there's high protection. Additional doses, even for Sinopharm, has shown antibody levels go up, but we don't know does up mean that you're going to be more likely to get the infection, uh, less likely to get the infection, but at least we know they're safe. There are not made any major safety signals so far of getting the extra dose. So to end, um, the question is, to boost or not to boost? And, you know, I really think everybody will need a booster. There's no doubt there in my mind for sure. But the, but, but the more important question is, um, and the more, and the lots of uncertainty is that we don't know when this is. So um, when, and don't, at an individual level, not at a social society level, which is the, I guess, the other conversation, but, you know, um, uh, do I need a booster at six months, which is some sort of a, somehow become an arbitrary sort of cutoff, I'm not sure where that came from, um, or, or three months, or, or yearly, or, or two yearly, um, uh, what do I need a booster with, um, it, with the same vaccine again, um, or does it make a difference if I, sorry, got an mRNA vaccine first, do I get uh, 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 an inactivated next, or, 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 or what do I get my booster with? Uh, and then who should get these boosters? Should it be those who are immunocompromised, who, um, uh, those who are elderly who may get more severe disease? Should it be healthcare workers who uh, are more likely to spread this infection to others um, uh, and who may be more at um, risk of getting the infection? Um, uh, is there a way to check antibodies? So all of these sort of big, big question marks are still there um, in this data and none of this data um, is there as yet to help us. Hopefully next year, if you ask me this, I will give you a nice crisp answer and a one slide presentation saying, this is what you're going to do. Thank you very much. Dr. Fessel, thank you so much. That was a fantastic um, overview and introduction to what we currently know about the science of, of boosters. And I think you've, you've put it so well that you know all of this data, it's, it's, it's there in a context. And that's what we've sort of, I think, perhaps missed is interpreting that data and understanding the contexts. Um, so thank you so much. And um, I'm gonna quickly hand over to Dr. Moodley um, to begin, begin her talk. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction to join today. Uh, I always look forward to being part of the discussions and uh, congratulations also on the um, birthday celebrations. I think 17 years is a milestone and something well worth celebrating. Um, could you please confirm if you can see my slide? Yes, yes we, can. we can. We can, Dr. Moody. All right. So, so I think I'll just set the scene. Um, thank you also to Dr. Mahmoud for uh, covering all the difficult scientific uh, aspects that we need to consider before we look at, at the ethics. Now, um, uh, South Africa, as you know, has a population of 60 million people approximately. Our adult population is about 40 million people. And um, currently, uh, we've given out over 18 million vaccine doses. And we're using the J&J &J single dose vaccine and Pfizer uh, two doses um, in, in the country at the moment. So what we do have is 24% of our adult population fully vaccinated. Uh, as things currently stand, we are doing about 200,000 uh, doses of, of, of vaccines per, per day at, at the moment. We have just emerged from our third wave. It's been a very long third wave, and we currently have under 1,000 cases a day. Um, so I think any discussion any discussion around um, uh, boosters um, with respect to vaccine has to be framed in the context of global inequity. We do know that there are many countries in the world that do not have uh, access to vaccines in sufficient quantities currently. And there are many, there are millions and billions of people around the world 
who have not had a first dose of vaccine as yet. And so it's within this context that uh, many global governance organizations like the WHO have been you know, speaking out against boosters uh, in high income countries against the context of lack of access in low and middle income countries. Now, in South Africa, we've been very fortunate to have a good supply of, of vaccines. And uh, since February of this year, we started off with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine initially that was rolled out to healthcare workers in the context of, a, uh, of an implementation trial. Um, it then extended to include uh, teachers and other vulnerable groups. And the actual vaccine rollout began with vulnerable populations like the elderly and proceeded. Now you will see from this diagram that uptake of vaccine, you know, uh, rises and falls with time. So in many cases, when um, a dose of that, a new age group was opened up for vaccination, the uptake of vaccines rose and then fell again and rose each time a new age group was invited. And, and we've had this, you know, up and down distribution in terms of, of vaccine uptake in the country, which has become quite worrying in the context of a good supply of vaccines. Uh, we also know that um, in our hospitals, in our high care units and intensive care units, we have a preponderance of unvaccinated people at the moment, despite vaccines being widely available. And so uptake is you know, not optimal as things stand. Even amongst healthcare workers, those who are unvaccinated, we know have a much higher risk of death uh, compared to healthcare workers who are vaccinated. And this is some of the data that's come out of the Western Cape during our recent third wave. What is happening that is very worrying in the country is the so-called compassion fatigue. And there are some doctors who are refusing to see unvaccinated patients as things stand. This is completely unprecedented and uh, is a sign of complete exhaustion and frustration after many healthcare workers, you know, having worked uh, tirelessly for the past uh, 19 to 20 months already uh, during the course of this pandemic. I think our third wave has been particularly difficult because it's been prolonged compared to the first and second waves in the country. Now, there's been a strong call for booster doses in South Africa for healthcare workers, largely because many healthcare workers, as I indicated earlier, started off in the early stages in February of, and March of this year, receiving a single dose of the J&J &J vaccine. And by July, August, September, many of these healthcare workers had started to have breakthrough infections. Now, in some cases, this was mild, as you know, is to be expected post-vaccine, but there were many healthcare workers who had moderate disease and severe disease, smaller in proportion compared to those who had mild. But with every case of a healthcare worker having uh, an infection, they are off work for two to three weeks, with the more severe cases having to stay off longer, to be on steroids, etc. And so there is concern about decreasing or waning immunity amongst healthcare workers in South Africa at the moment. Now, as things stand, there is no policy in the country around booster doses. And I've written this piece that was published a few days ago um, you know, exploring some of the issues related to how healthcare professionals feel in the country at the moment. And the piece looks in more detail at a strong desire for healthcare professionals to have a booster dose of a vaccine. Now, there is no policy on booster doses for anybody in South Africa at the moment. So we are not doing booster doses. We are trying as best as possible to make sure that everybody accesses a first dose uh, in amongst the adult population. We are also not immunizing people under the age of 18, even though the Pfizer vaccine is registered for use uh, under 18. 
So as things stand, the vaccines are available in the country. They're accessible by anybody 18 years and older. Uh, we have over 3,000 vaccination sites and lots of you know, messaging and communication around uh, vaccine uptake. The sad part of this is that uh, you know, we have not reached our target of 300,000 doses a day. Uh, currently, we're around 200,000 doses being administered per day. There are, uh, we, we have now the scenario of potential wastage of vaccine doses, and of course, uh, vaccine expiry. An important public health ethics principle is efficiency. And we know that we have you know, a very valuable supply of vaccines at the moment. And there is an obligation to ensure that these vaccines are used efficiently, but we have time that is definitely not on our side at the moment. And we risk losing vaccines, um, an extremely valuable commodity uh, if uptake is not sufficient. And so there have been many calls that instead of doses being wasted or, allow, or being allowed to expire uh, and having to be discarded, that those supplies are offered to healthcare workers on the front line who are at particularly at risk and who seem to be having breakthrough infections that is impacting the healthcare system. And so these have been the, the calls, the pleas, the petitions that have gone out to the Department of Health that while there is no policy in terms of boosters, that everybody who, you know, that, that who amongst the healthcare worker group who would, would desire to have a vaccine is a booster is allowed to access one via vaccination sites where there are no shows or potentially expiring doses. Now, the dilemma we face is that many of the healthcare workers have received a first dose of the J&J &J vaccine. And uh, the doses that we do have potentially, you know, uh, reaching expiry might be the Pfizer vaccines. And so the heterologous boost with a J&J &J vaccine followed by a Pfizer is a little bit problematic because our Department of Health says that there is no evidence for use of boosters in this way. At the same time, there are many healthcare providers who are accessing a Pfizer dose under the radar or abroad um, because they need to protect themselves. And so we have this you know, scenario of people taking a Pfizer vaccine followed by a j, &J with no ill effect. So as things currently stand, you know, the plea to the Department of Health is to avoid wastage of vaccines, to avoid expiry and, you know, discarding of vaccines, that only those doses are offered to healthcare workers who wish to take it at their own risk under full consent uh, procedures. I think at the end of the day, we understand equity issues around boosters. And as far as possible, we need the global community to access at least one dose of a vaccine. But in scenarios such as we have in South Africa, where there is adequate supply, reducing demand and potential wastage, that an argument could be made for offering vaccines to frontline healthcare workers, to the immunocompromised, to the elderly, and to those groups who would potentially benefit from having a, a, a booster dose, because ultimately this reduces the pressure on our healthcare system and hopefully will lead to a much smaller fourth wave uh, should, should it arrive in the future. So I'm going to stop and thank you for your time and I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Moodley for sharing uh, the South African experience. And it's really remarkably interesting that um, you know, we, we share some similarities that I hope we can talk about later on uh, at the end once we start the question and answer session um, and we have a panel discussion. But just to let you know that we also don't have a booster policy as yet in Pakistan. However, the booster has been approved for healthcare, frontline healthcare workers. So um, I'm going to now, because we're just running a little short on time and I do want to try and get through the questions that are being posted in the chat right now. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Sunil, welcome. 
Um, I'm just going to invite you to start your talk. Thank you, uh, Dr. Natasha and CBAC for the invitation. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Faisal has actually, uh, and Dr. Moodley, Professor Moodley has made my slides very uh, easy because I want uh, to explain okay, what vaccine effectiveness and vaccine efficacy is. So efficacy is basically in trial setting, just Dr. Faisal said, and effectiveness, what's in real world actually. These are the terms which uh, comes again and again uh, during my presentation. So uh, I have basically choose to uh, have United States uh, as a, a prototype uh, and we'll be see okay, whether uh, this vaccine effectiveness in vulnerable population is working because the, uh, here I could find uh, data from that. So this is how uh, Delhi admissions in uh, US started in the November. They had a huge peak. They started their vaccines at that time. And then we saw a fall in cases in around uh, mid-March time. But um, then again, from July onwards, they saw a huge rise in cases in admissions with COVID, confirmed COVID and admissions uh, from starting from July. Uh, then what happened at that time, actually? So before that, in April, we have seen in India, there was a huge uh, outbreak of COVID um, secondary to uh, Delta variant in which followed later on that in the United States uh, in mid of uh, June, men they have only 30% cases with Delta variant, but that spreads in just a month time. It's that whatever they are doing genomic sequencing, almost 100% of their cases are of Delta variant. And we know Delta variant spreads more uh, easily than previous variants, and it can cause more infections to patients. So uh, again, looking back at uh, May to July data, uh, their cases do fall, but they again, they saw a huge rise in cases uh, starting from, again from July. But there is a wide difference between those these black dots are those who are unvaccinated and this blue one are those who are vaccinated. So there's a huge gap between vaccinated and unvaccinated. If we see hospitalization data, the same. The, there is rise in hospitalization data for unvaccinated, but it seems that hospitalization data for vaccinated people is combined, it's almost there. And the same goes with deaths. If we, uh, again, looked at uh, from uh, my talk, those who are vulnerable population, these are the population which we prioritize when we started our vaccine rollout, okay, those who have aged more than 65 years, those who have more than uh, frontline healthcare workers, then those with comorbidities, they were prioritized in that. So I will see uh, what's the vaccine effectiveness amongst these populations, uh, what's the data said about that. So in age, uh, this is actually, uh, again, uh, data from US, okay, those who have 65 years old, past this June, July, when they have a, uh, Delta variant, the vaccine effectiveness, uh, those hospitalizations seems to be more common in those who have aged more than 65 years as compared to those who have uh, less than 60 years. And this is actually a slide from uh, data from Israel in which those who have received vaccines in January, they seems to have more risk of COVID hospitalization per 1,000 population as compared to those who have vaccine, received vaccines in Feb or less. Same, uh, when we see uh, laboratory confirmed uh, cases from New York State, their vaccine effectiveness in May was around above 90%, but with the time and these blue dots, this is actually uh, uh, Delta variants and once it's dominantly variant in US, the vaccine effectiveness seems to be fall. And this fall seems to be fall for all uh, actually uh, ages group, those who have uh, between 18, 49, 64. But when we looked at those who have hospitalized, their effectiveness is, is above 90%. And uh, although this yellow line, uh, this orange line, this is for those who have aged more than 65 years, it seems that effectiveness pre-Delta has dropped to uh, around 90% uh, 
uh, after the Delta variant. Actually, again, this is data till August, so uh, we don't know after later on. This is the data till uh, August 23. So vaccine effectiveness for those who have aged more than 65, this seems to be reduced for hospitalization uh, amongst those. Amongst uh, immunocompromised population and those with comorbidities, actually uh, from March till August, uh, uh, most of the patients who got admitted in US, they have uh, either obesity or hypertension, cardiovascular disease, immune suppression. These are more likely to develop. This is actually, we have seen from data also, that these are more prone to develop uh, severe disease. But when we looked at uh, vaccine effectiveness against hospitalization, uh, those with no underlying conditions, this uh, spa, uh, vaccine effectiveness, whether pre-Delta or post-Delta, it's almost similar. Uh, those have uh, more than one underlying conditions, uh, it has almost similar, although a bit lower than uh, with no comorbidities, but it's again almost in same range. Delta variant hasn't done anything to them. Those with hypertension, almost same, and same goes with obesity. This means that those who have some comorbidities, uh, they don't have uh, uh, vaccine effectiveness reduced in the era of Delta variant. But if we, uh, as Dr. Fassel has rightly pointed out, okay, when we looked at immune response, which is again a not an ideal way of knowing whether the patient is uh, uh, properly uh, have vaccine effectiveness or not but the immune response was very poor in patients with either cancer or hemodialysis, particularly poor with those who received organ transplants and those who are on immunosuppressive. So as compared to healthy individuals, which can have 95%, their antibody response be very poor, even with two doses of uh, the vaccine, which is available in US, which is messenger RNA vaccines, the response was very poor in them. So uh, for them, actually a uh, concept of additional COVID, this is not booster, this is an additional vaccine dose. And when uh, we looked at data uh, for immunocompromise, even giving a third dose, uh, the zero positivity is not optimal. Antibody response is in the range of 33 to 50% in those who are on hemodialysis or solid organ transplant recipient. This means even the third dose probably haven't done much to their immune response, although better than second dose, but not uh, again uh, the what level we supposed to see in patients with uh, normal without immune system. So probably the, even the three doses are not working them. What should be our protocol? That's all. then to health workers who are on the front line of our uh, basically COVID management, what uh, they have gone through for last uh, one and a half year. Uh, when we looked at data uh, from, again, from US, from San Diego University, in which they compared the data from March till July, and when we see their attack rate, it was uh, 0.21 per 1,000 for fully vaccinated people, as compared to unvaccinated was 3.4. That we know that those who are vaccinated, they are uh, basically safe from uh, having severe disease, but that with the gradually with the time that from 0.21 rose to 5.7. This July really correlates with actually the peak of co uh, Delta variant in US. And for unvaccinated, this is 16.4. Uh, but we, when we looked at vaccine effect effectiveness, that drops from in San Diego population, their frontline healthcare workers from 93.9% uh, to 65%. And this is uh, for symptomatic COVID. Uh, when we looked at another, uh, basically a recovered trial from India, uh, from US, when they looked at whether vaccine effectiveness against SARS-CoV uh, predominance, uh, that those who have completed more than 150 days post this road, their vaccine effectiveness has dropped to 73% as compared to those who have uh, around less than three months of this is FT5%. But there's a huge difference between 91% to 66% in those who develop uh, uh, basically in the era of Delta variant. And we know that the Delta variant data is of only July to August. So we don't have uh, much data from that. Although it doesn't have uh, enough power uh, to look at uh, the time when the, there's a Delta variant going on, but it seems that vaccine effectiveness has dropped in among healthcare workers as they completed their six months of their vaccination. 
so uh, uh, does booster works basically and this dr faisal has already described as a paper from his trial in which they in the july they have given those who have more than 60 years they have given a booster dose additional booster dose to their population and basically in their uh, data it shows ke uh, they have uh, those people who have the c booster they have less severe disease at least in age more than 65 although we don't have much uh, time duration for that it's just a one month data but it seems that for age more than 65 there's less risk of hospitalization those who have severe severe illness from that with a reduction of factor by 19.5 so uh, as we know hospitalization rates are uh, 10 to times higher in one vaccinated as compared to vaccinated adults vulnerable group seems to be more prone to severe disease once they pass the 6 months of vaccination although we have very limited data available with us to support this uh, but it seems that but we should keep in mind our mind that Uh, delta variant has shown us that we are not safe until everyone is safe uh, this actually looks uh, actually uh, difficult when uh, the who target of 40% of population uh, in this orange one whole of africa is likely to miss their 40% target by the end of december we have only already only 15 countries who receive uh, 10% of their Uh, doses vaccinated people among africa uh, till september 30th so we are likely to miss and as i told actually we have to now decide ke whether we are giving happy by just giving vaccine to low income countries even they are not protected by saying ke we are giving vaccine to them or we are boosting our vaccine supply to them and keep them safe to keep ourselves safe thank you Thank you so much Dr Sunil this was really um this is fantastic you know giving us a a real insight into the vulnerable population and uh you know what the impact of a booster uh, dose would be for for them and also for healthcare workers and i think that this is extremely important when we start to talk about um risk and benefit and justification for uh for additional doses Uh, in vulnerable groups and then also for health, frontline healthcare workers so we'll, we'll come back to this uh, in the in the question and answer session later on thank you so much for your talk um dr faiza um may i invite you to please start start your talk dr faiza you're on mute sorry sorry <laughs> See, I'm struggling with the sharing here for some reason. <laughs> uh, we need to. Yeah, uh, okay. Has uh, Has Dr. Sunil stopped sharing? Yes, he has. Okay. All right. Let's. I hope you can hear me. Yes, you can. You know you very well. Yep, and you are sharing. Great. Thanks so much. So. Um, I think my case is uh, slightly easier to make. In fact, you may hear me whining a bit when I talk about this uh, because we're going to talk about vaccines for children. Should they be given? Should not they be given? Should we prioritize and and all the sorts? So I'm Faiza Jahan and I'm an associate professor and a pediatrician in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health. and uh, you know vaccination in children and even mandatory vaccination in children is really not a new concept we all know that it's a commonly accepted practice in fact uh, uh, what you see here on the screen side by side is the mandatory vaccination schedule for pakistan versus uh, you know what is recommended in the us so what you can see is that in developed countries uh, a child or an adolescent until he's like an uh, a child till 18 years of age uh, can receive up to 30 injections or more by the time he turns 18 um introduction of vaccines for children has been happening uh, uh historically we started with you know the the basic vaccines then we added the pneumonia vaccine meningitis vaccine and so on and so forth so this again is not a new uh, problem in fact who 
has published uh, several toolkits that can enable uh, people or governments or public health personnel to decide when to introduce a new vaccine. And the process is basically, it's a systematic process, uh, which is taking care of the data as well as the qualitative uh, issues that are involved. When we introduce a new vaccine, we also ask, uh, you know, who are the people, uh, what are the ages the vaccine should be given? Should we prioritize risk groups? Uh, which vaccine should we give? We know for the COVID vaccine that there are a variety of uh, vaccines available. Then the number of doses, um, people wonder, especially for children, whether a single dose may suffice, whether two doses may be too reactogenic, uh, when and how should you give the vaccine? Should it be part of the, you know, incorporated into the routine immunization in school? So all of those considerations need to be made. But before that, we need to ask ourselves, should children be vaccinated for, and uh, let me complete that sentence, should children be vaccinated for, the, for COVID-19 or vaccinated against COVID-19? So the point I'm trying to make here is that children are very much likely to be infected and almost similarly to adults. This is a, a little study that we did um, in Karachi in two districts where you can see that uh, uh, the, this is the zero prevalence of um, SARS-CoV-2 antibody across different age groups. And basically, uh, and gender, what you see is that there is hardly any difference in the zero prevalence rates and the 95% confidence intervals uh, between age groups, for instance, zero to four years versus uh, 60 uh, plus years. However, children have been relatively spared uh, because we have not seen the rates of severe infections in children as we have seen in adults. Um, the proportion, what you see here is the proportion of SARS-CoV-2 positive children who were defined uh, asymptomatic in these reported list of studies. Uh, and below where you see the blue diamond is the random effects model, which is showing you uh, sort of the summary statistics. So what we see here is that about 21% of children uh, infected in this uh, systematic review have shown to be asymptomatic. Unfortunately, um, we do not have disaggregated data for symptomatic uh, COVID in children in Pakistan. So I'm going to borrow this slide from the CDC, which is uh, what we see here is uh, we see the rates of uh, positivity in children uh, from you know across the time and where what you, what is important to see here is that uh, compared to 2.6 percent of child cases at the beginning of uh, of of the pandemic what you see now is almost a quarter of the children uh, in the U.S. are now having symptomatic infections. This is likely a reflection, uh, you know, and an impact of several factors. So there may be face-to-face -face school opening, which is involved here. Um, there may also be a role of the Delta variant, but this is very relevant to scenario in Pakistan, where we anticipate the face-to-face -face component of teaching to increase from 50% to 100%. And then obviously with our low rates of vaccination, the concern about ongoing, uh, uh, you know, coming up of uh, new, va new variants of concern. Um, children, a large number of children are symptomatic. However, we do know that there are certain risk groups where severe illness uh, is more likely. And these are groups where we still think that the child may be more likely to be admitted with COVID rather than because of COVID. But still, we do see that uh, in these unprotected, vulnerable group of children, severe illness is uh, much more likely and it, and it can in, uh, result in an increase in mortality. Um, when we look at the differential in mortality rate with pediatric COVID uh, by income and you know by 
in uh, LMICs versus high income countries, where we have data for low and middle income countries, we do see that uh, the deaths per million in, uh, due to COVID in children are much, much higher than the high income countries. And none of this actually is a surprise because it just follows the patterns of other uh, infectious diseases. Um, this, is a, this is a slide from our own study. Uh, this is unpublished data of uh, sentence, redoing uh, severe COVID surveillance across five hospitals in Pakistan. So uh, what, what this slide really shows is that the mortality from COVID, the orange bar is the number of cases and the yellow bar is the number of deaths that are being uh, reported. And what you see here is that the, uh, the mortality rate has, has slightly been creeping up and you know it's about 34% it has been in August, which we attribute to possibly the, the Delta variant. But also there are many other factors in play. Our children are more malnourished. Um, they, they, they seek care much later. Uh, there is poor control or care of chronic diseases. So all of these put children at a very big risk of uh, more severe morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. And then I'm not even talking about uh, MISC and long COVID here. So there is recent data I think I saw this yesterday, last night, that um, one that long COVID, which means persistence of uh, persistence of symptoms from COVID in children, can can be for uh, up to one in seven children can have long COVID. Um, MISC is a myocarditis that results from COVID, and it is a later man manifestation of COVID infections in children. So my interpretation of all this data and everything that I see around myself is that COVID-19 is a significant problem in children and uh, we do require prevention against severe illness uh, in children. Um, impact of any intervention in children would be more visible and more, uh, the impetus would be greater in the face of schools reopening, full attendance uh, and uh, reopening to full attendance with the sort of adult immunization rates that we have which are suboptimal, and there is, uh, you know, the risk of always uh, uh, incoming new variants to emerge. And then vaccination could be one of the best ways to, to actually prevent all of this. Uh, when we think of introducing COVID-19 vaccines for children, we think of, you know, vaccine, we look at the efficacy and effectiveness, a lot has been spoken about that, but we have other concerns, for instance, reactogenicity, adverse effects. Um, the, there are always concerns about individual freedom, freedom of the child, the issues of consent. So I'm just going to briefly touch upon uh, each of these. So clinical trials to test the efficacy and safety of COVID-19 uh, under 12 years of age are currently ongoing for the commonly known Western vaccines here. And uh, you see it here. However, I must say that uh, there has been a recent a phase one, phase two uh, study, which has, uh, th this is from China, where they have shown that uh, both a low or a high dose of uh, an inactivated SARS-CoV-2 vaccine is similarly uh, efficacious in, the, in uh, increasing neutralizing antibody titers uh, as compared to um, a placebo, which here they have used aluminum hydroxide uh, only. Um, now, with all of these trials ongoing, you know, there is another ethical dilemma. So there are countries who have actually started vaccinating children as young as two years of age. So for instance, Cuba. Cuba has a homegrown vaccine, uh, which is not recognized by the WHO, but uh, they have decided that they will start inoculating children two months to 18 years with this vaccine and they have made the vaccine likely it is, uh, it is mandatory as well. So with all of these things going on, I think there's a lot of uh, where the pressure from the, where, from the high income countries is also a reason why LMIC governments are you know, pressurized or there's public pressure to initiate the vaccine program in children. And this is something that I feel 
And I fear that um, our government may also come under this pressure because currently we know, you know that we have not given Moderna or Pfizer as the primary vaccine in Pakistan. So what is going to be the primary vaccine for children in Pakistan if and when we go there? We still do not know that. So in the absence of data, this rapid implementation uh, of the vaccine in, in children less than uh, 12 years of age is, is a little somewhat concerning. Now, MR, miRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna, we know very well that they have high efficacy. Uh, this is a paper in the NEGM where the study done in adolescents showed an overall efficacy of up to 100% uh, uh, against SARS-CoV-2 infection. And, and, the, and it was the result of this, this promising study that many countries now have, uh, have employed the COVID vaccine um, in, in their, for children. Uh, the latest to join the club has been the UK. So um, we are overall, we are concerned about adverse events. Uh, this is again data from the CDC uh, where they have vaccinated millions and millions of children. Uh, overall, uh, I think this is 11,000 doses and this is from um, May, I think. So 11,000 doses. And where, what you see here is that there is an important, uh, so, so you have all the commonly known side effects like dizziness, syncope, which is, which in all of these uh, three, 11 million doses, sorry, in these 11, uh, 21 million doses, you see a small number of side effects. And these side effects are not uh, very uh, serious. However, myocarditis and pericarditis, are uh, important side effects. And these are serious enough to be, to be an important consideration, even if the number of reports are small. And um, I'm, gonna come, I'm gonna come to this again, but when we have a side effect as serious as this, we need to take in consideration the very fine uh, risk versus benefit uh, issue. And so um, I think, for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, the benefit versus risk assessment is, uh, has been laid out and I've taken some of my slides from uh, the SAGE working group that I work with uh, for, you know, that's working towards introduction of the COVID-19 vaccines in children. So the benefit for a COVID-19 vaccine for children would be, you know, where you have a reduction in the uh, symptomatic cases, hospitalizations, and deaths uh, from COVID-19, and the harm would be uh, for with the you know myocarditis after the miRNA vaccine. And again, we are going to look at uh, myocarditis, pericarditis data from the U.S. And uh, by the way, the symptoms of myocarditis, most cases of myocarditis after the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine are a pounding of the heart and a fast heart rate. And unless you test that, you will not be able to identify that this is myocarditis. And in about 70% of the cases, these resolve on its own. It's, it's, a, it's a small number that needs further treatment. However, all the cases do require observation. So this is uh, the reported case of myocarditis and pericarditis after vaccination. In, from, this is data from June, 2021, 133 million vaccine doses were given, and this is uh, this is what was seen after the second dose, disaggregated by age and by gender. And as you can see, that in the younger age group, this uh, this myocarditis rate is uh, slightly higher. However, not as high because what you see here is the reporting rate is actually the myocarditis cases per one million of messenger RNA vaccine received. So a small, albeit significant uh, rate. But when we look at the, you know, when we compare the cases of these myocarditis with the benefit of vaccination, so, you know, the benefit versus risk of myocarditis, we do see that COVID-19 associated hospital, a large number of COVID-19 hospitalizations can be prevented uh, with a small, uh, smaller risk of 
having myocarditis. But then we also have so many indirect benefits from vaccinating children. So, you know, improvement in educational health, improvement in mental health of the child, um, the, the potential to give physical mobility, freedom uh, to the child. Currently, children are under lockdown. They are unable to go to parks. Um, uh, you know, the, the open spaces which are free to us are not available to children right now. Uh, and, and other benefits that children can get from, from moving around and social interaction, they have all been affected. And then this, there's a societal benefit as well. This, vaccinating the children would impact overall community transmission, especially for a country like Pakistan, where there is, you know, um, where our uh, pyramid is such that our population is much, much younger and we have far more children than we have adults. Um, One minute, Yes. One more minute. Uh, we'll be running out of time. Yeah, so sure, sure. I'm just wrapping up. Thank you so much. So the uh, give, giving vaccine in children is is a finely balanced benefit risk uh, risk that I believe my take takeaway is favors vaccination. We need to continue the monitoring of cases and long-term myocarditis. If Pakistan decides to introduce the vaccine, I still feel that it will probably be the, the Pfizer or the Moderna that if, if we do begin, this is what we are going to start with. But we also need to review the trial data itself. Currently, a lot of this data is coming from phase one, phase two studies, and uh, it has it is not made openly public through peer-reviewed peer uh, um, uh, channels. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Faiza. Thank you for wrapping that up so quickly. And um, and thank you for highlighting the importance of the, the evidence base that we need in order to make an informed decision about which way to move towards vaccinating children. So thank you very much for, for highlighting that. Um, so thank you to all four of our speakers for doing um, a stellar job today. Um, thank you so much. And um, what I'm going to do now is uh, open up um, to some of the questions that we've been getting in through the chat. Um, I, I, before I go to, to the questions, I just want to sort of, again, perhaps um, highlight the fact that um, last week there was a, again a fantastic session on uh, booster shots, uh, which uh, one of the speakers was Dr. Katie O'Brien from the WHO. And she made, you know, she showed some phenomenal data on projection and uh, prediction, uh, the data that the WHO had been working on. And it basically said, had the vaccines, had these vaccine doses been more equitably shared globally, we would have on the 29th of September, 2021, we would have vaccinated 40% of uh, the population in each country. And I think that that's phenomenal con compared to uh, what we've achieved right now for low, low middle income countries. Um, so putting that there right out there for our audience and for our panelists, um, I'd like to start off with, um, with a question here that came in um, from Dr. Mozum. Um, would it be fair to say, therefore, that currently we do not have robust data to support that, uh, that except for exceptions, booster at this time should not be a global priority? I guess this, this could go out to perhaps uh, all of you. Uh, so who would like to start by, uh, would anybody like to reply to this question? Uh, Dr. Fessel, can I ask you to maybe start, um, start us off here? I guess, uh, the, and, and I think the next comment was was spot on, that it, it really is, when people ask me about a booster, the answer is, um, I need to either put my public health hat on or my individual person hat on. And that's where it uh, it boils down to. So if you ask me, is this a priority globally, then you uh, no, it's not because of the large number of people who need to be vaccinated for the first dose. Is it a priority on an individual um, level? Um, and, and that sort of really does depend on who the individual is and what their risk is. You know, if a, if a 20 year old comes to me um, and says, I got a vaccine six months ago, should I get a booster? I'd be like, no. But if uh, an 80, plus 80 year old comes to me um, who's diabetic, who has hypertension um, and got uh, sort of an inactivated vaccine six months ago, and they say, you know, I have access to Pfizer um, or, or any other vaccine, uh, do you think I should get uh, a booster or revaccination? I'd say, yes, I think you should, because if you have access to it. 
But would I make this as a policy at this point? Uh, I, I think it's a little premature. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for, for that, Dr. Fessel. And, um, and Dr. Moodley, um, I mean, you, you know, you were, your focus in South Africa has been on the position of healthcare workers. So, um, so, so what do you think about the booster shots in terms of the global equity? No, absolutely agree in terms of global equity. You know, uh, there's no argument to be made for widespread uh, booster doses being given to everybody in, in all countries at this point in time. Uh, definitely agree that a targeted approach is necessary in context where there is adequate supply that only the vulnerable and those at high risk, you know, may have access. Um, not over and above, you know, everyone else who does not have access at all to a first dose. So yes, um, no, I'm in agreement on that. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Sunil, I mean, you know, we've just spoken about vulnerable groups. And I mean, it would be, I think, again, quite a challenge, right, when you're looking at the, the vulnerable groups that you presented in your talk. Um, and, and, you know, how do we weigh these? What weightage do we give to, to you know, which order we would actually um, you know, prioritize the boosters even. I think that's also quite a big challenge. Yes, uh, so probably uh, again, this is uh, Dr. Fessel said, uh, need to uh, take every case as individual. For example, take example, if I have a 20 year old renal transplant recipient who received high immunosuppression just uh, six months back, that's, that's actually, a, uh, I know even, three doses, which is actually not a booster dose for him, it's additional dose, but that will be counted from a national, uh, basically vaccine supply, uh, is may not be enough because we have data coming from transplant recipients, maybe three doses may not be a sufficient. And that's with the messenger on the vaccine, uh, we don't have data from inactivated vaccine. Mm -hmm. Even same goes with, we have seen that this Delta variant, at least from United States data said, he, those who have been even with vaccinated with a, a messenger in the vaccine, the vaccine effectiveness was uh, more than 90%. That drops to 66%. So again, if you ask me, amongst the healthier workers, I would prioritize those who have more risk of developing a disease, just like anesthetists, who uh, are high risk profession for developing as compared to those who are sitting in office and doing work. They are counted as basically work healthcare workers, but they have no direct exposure to patient. And among even those healthcare workers, as we have seen that uh, even with our own vaccines, uh, which we have started with, that those who have aged more than 60 years, uh, they are now, once they pass the six months bar, they are more prone to develop severe disease. So amongst even healthcare workers, those who have more than 55 years or maybe 60 years, they should be prioritized actually. Again, all depends upon national supply how the national supply is coming up to us because that's we are purchasing and that's also coming to COVAX. So this is where this is where the science becomes so much more important, right? Because that's what should drive our decisions and our weightage in terms of. Uh, sorry, Dr. Mozum, you have a you have a question. Dr. Mozum, would you comment? You're on mute. Sorry. Apologies. This is just in continuation of what we're talking about. So the issue is how much if you vaccinate somebody, what is, you know, how good is the immunity and for how long? But I'm not a microbiologist and maybe Dr. Fessel or somebody else can talk about it. When you develop immunity after vaccination, it is not just one form of immunity. And I think Dr. Fessel had checked on that. So my impression is, is how effective and now I'm talking of not the efficiency, but the effectiveness, I would again argue, it's not just on just drawing, um, uh, drawing a level, it is much broader. And, I, and perhaps somebody can help on that. That data is not in, am I correct? Or maybe I'm not. That is still something that is being worked out. Dr. Fessel, could you comment on that? It, it, it is, and, and, and the issue is that if me as an individual is gonna get infected with, uh, with, with SARS-CoV-2 or get COVID, it's not only just also my immunity um, or immunity level. There's so many factors that go into me getting infected yes. 
ranging from uh, my uh, immune status, uh, uh, ranging from what variant it is, what my level of exposure was, you know, how long I was exposed to, uh, you know, and what I was doing when I was exposed. So there's so many variables that go into it. Vaccine is just one of those many variables. And that's also the reason why we say even after you get vaccinated, you have to keep wearing the mask and so on and so forth, because it is only one layer. It's not the only thing that's protecting us. Yeah. And that's why getting the answer to this from observational studies is so tricky and so difficult, because you have to put in context um, when you're looking at these big numbers, what was happening in the country um, at that point? So Israel is a great example where everything was open. Um, the risk of exposure was huge um, I, I, at that point. Um, and then they have the Delta variant coming in. Um, so, 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 so you're right. I mean, it, we, we, that data is not there, but, you know, and, and, and linking this um, antibody T cell response to infection um, is not very easy um, uh, to do, especially since we don't have a correlate or protection. We don't know um, if if I have X antibody or X something, um, am I immune or not? Um, so this correlate of protection is still not there. We're getting closer, for sure. I mean, a, a couple of months ago, I would say we have no idea. Now we're actually at least a little closer to getting it. And maybe in a few months, we will have this. But for now, we don't have it. Thank you, Dr. Thank Pessel. you. Um, so the, there's an, there's another question. There's actually, uh, sorry, before I go to the question, there's a comment by Dr. Bushra Jamil. She just wants to say that Pakistan has started vaccinating children 12 years and above with the Pfizer vaccine. Um, so Dr. Dr. Pfizer, what do you, um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the data that we ought to now sort of use as evidence and to have there available for us in order to keep monitoring and making sure we can actually uh, evaluate how good this particular vaccination for 12 and above is going to be in Pakistan? So yes, I think this was in September that they have started uh, vaccinating children 12 years and above. Uh, however, we are not following, to my knowledge, our vaccine adverse effect re reporting uh, you know, system is, is pretty skilly mm. right now. Yeah. So I think moving forwards, Pakistan has done a great thing, but I just want to say again that Pfizer is not available to more than 50% of the, of the country's children because it will be concentrated in cities. It is present in only certain centers. So um, I wanted to actually make a comment related to boosters and, uh, you know, it, it's not directly child related comment, but my my comment about boosters was that the dreadful thing that will happen with widespread boosters is that we will lose the opportunity to learn. The primary introduction of the COVID vaccine, and we know this from, you know, I know this from immunization in children, that when the gap between dose one and dose two increases, the immunogenicity also increases, right? And we know that because of the pandemic and the urgency, we vaccinated very closely together. So we really need to evaluate uh, before we go completely into this booster business, um, we need to evaluate different kinds of schedules, other ways to improve immunogenicity. So, uh, you know, pediatric vaccines, boosters are given all the time for tetanus, but they're given like 10 years or five yeah. years or two years. So, Dr. Pfizer, do you, think that, I mean, do you think that that's been a big challenge, not only in Pakistan, but globally, that really a lot of the factors driving policy decisions have not been evidence-based and they've been more, you know, uh, politically based or more sort of public pressure based? Yes, absolutely. Um, every pandemic is more political than, uh, than science. So this is not new. You know, the, the flu pandemic was exactly the same. Decisions are governed by the people who are in power. And it's only countries like Pakistan who have actually been, you know, talking to scientists and physicians who are contributing to the COVID response. So Pakistan's COVID response has been phenomenal in the region yes. as well. Yes, yes. And yes. we have spoken to, Dr. Faisal has been part of those discussions. We have spoken to, you know, the, the Bangladesh governments. Uh, Dr. Bushra has also been part of this, uh, of how we manage our, our response. So yes, response is very, very critical. And, and in terms of setting the right objectives and, and having at least um, an giving an importance to the, you know, the ethical fallout of any kind of decision that's made. Um, I, I mean, I, this, this probably will to any of the panelists and hopefully you can all comment on this. Um, you know, again, 
um, how much importance do you think um, you know the eth the ethics has been given uh, in in making a lot of these you know policy decisions of boosters uh, in globally and also within Pakistan? We haven't made a policy decision yet. I mean that's that's very you know that's 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 that very important to state. But um, you know I don't see any uh, bioethicist on the NCOC, and I, I find that you know you know, sad. Uh, may I respond to that? Jeed, oh, Dr. Bushra, Assalamu alaikum. Yes, Assalamu alaikum. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad yes. you're here. Yes, yes. I was listening very intently with great interest. So um, uh, the decisions which NCOC makes are considered from every angle. So I've seen the process, so I can assure you that every possible aspect is examined and re-examined and sent to different groups of experts and their opinion is sought. So no decision is either politically motivated or made by an individual. So it's not just possible to, for an individual to make a decision over there. So all, all are uh, actually, uh, uh, the, the relevant groups are engaged and their opinion is sought and then a decision is made. And that's why this decision on booster has been pending for some time. Although the need to give additional doses and boosters has been recognized and you'll see these decisions coming in, in bits and pieces, not as a blanket decision because all the evidence is weighed carefully and then matched with uh, available vaccine supply. So, and uh, it's really heartening to see that the daily vaccinations uh, often cross the 1 million mark. So Pakistan has done a great job and then many cities are approaching the 40% mark and that's why only those, the, the cities which have approached the 40% mark of being fully vaccinated are being opened up and that's where the schools are opening up. And for children, another thing which, we, which is coming in and which where some problem is being uh, expected is the, school vaccination drive. So vaccines will be offered in schools and parents will be given the opt out opportunity. So that- Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's going to be quite challenging, isn't it? Because it, yeah, yeah, again, yeah. that's going to raise its own ethical issues. Dr. Mozam had a, I think has a question for you, Dr. Bush. Yeah, no, just a very quick comment because I know we're running out of time. Dr. Bush, I do appreciate what Pakistan has done and the role of NCOC. My comment is to what, something you said, political decisions are not made by individuals only. Political decisions are also made by groups. So that's just a comment. So it's good, even though, you know, you take uh, advice from different uh, people, but it would be I think it would be difficult to rule out the political element in every country in the decisions that are being taken. So that's just a comment. That's my opinion. Okay, thank you, thank everybody. You. I think we're, we're, we're sort of now run out of time. In the last few, few minutes, I just want to thank all our panelists and the audience. Um, and really just to, again, reinforce the fact that, you know, um, however we deal with this pandemic from now, uh, onwards in terms of now wanting to end this pandemic. Um, it really needs a strong objective driven um, approach. We need, we need to know what it is that we want to achieve. We need to find evidence for that. And, and I think it needs to be done, um, you know, collectively with, with, a, with a broader uh, approach and not just an individual approach. I think this is, again, a very strong me message from the WHO, um, you know, discouraging governments from making decisions of booster shots uh, uh, to, you know, making them generally available, uh, not, not discounting vulnerable groups. But, uh, but, you know, for, for people who, according to Mike Ryan, we've given two life jackets through, do they really need a third life jacket? So I think that, you know, considering all of that, um, that, you know, in terms of, do we feel alone as Pakistan, as a nation, having, you know, having to rely on donations of vaccines and how we then distribute these vaccines in, in an equitable and equal fashion is, is, is also very, very important. So thank you, uh, Dr. Bushra, you have your hand up. Yes, is that, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Just one more comment. 
Uh, regarding uh, the ability to vaccinate the population, the countries which have not been able to vaccinate their people, they, they lack the capacity to actually store and transport vaccines as well. So it's not just the actual process of vaccination, it's the peripheralia which surrounds yeah. the entire yeah. process. Yeah. And I think, it, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's gotten the WHO to now asking countries, LMICs to plan for their own production and, and, and to sort of make them a little bit more independent. So, um, but thank you everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a fan fantastic discussion. Uh, to all our uh, panelists, to uh, Dr. Ahmed, to Seebeck, to the uh, Medical Microbiology Infectious Diseases Society of Pakistan, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, I hand over to you for the final closing. I think Dr. Mazam wanted to say something and then I'll come in. Yes, I, uh, Dr. Moodley, uh, thank you for your presentation. We ran out of time and I was really interested and maybe we can talk about it sometimes later. The policies or what you want to do for boosters. The issue was, has South Africa, so boosters for like healthcare professionals, uh, has South Africa considered any, making any of the stuff mandatory, which Pakistan has done. Pakistan has, you, you know, you can't travel, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think we've run out of time, but I find uh, South Africa has lessons we can learn. Do you have any mandates in now? Uh, yes. So, so just to let you know, our digital vaccine certificates are being, you know, rolled out. We have an app that's coming. So those measures are going to be put into place for indoor venues mostly um, and various uh, healthcare organizations like private hospitals have implemented a mandatory vaccine policy for all their staff and contractors. Universities in South Africa, Stellenbosch, my university is busy with the process for mandatory vaccination. Um, and so is the University of Cape Town. Uh, our major medical aid funder, Discovery Health, has made it mandatory for all their staff. So one by one, organizations are starting to implement these mandatory policies, and that will certainly help to improve uptake. Thanks. Thank you. So I think, uh, th thank you. I would like to also thank the, all the panelists and the, and the participants. Now it's, to me, it sometimes looks like uh, uh, the, the situation of the, of the tail wagging the dog. Um, uh, the, the, in, in the, the globe, the entire world is like a lab and we're experimenting and we really don't have enough data to actually be able to make considered decisions that we've been used to in the past because we are in fast forward, we are in um, warp speed or whatever you might call it. Faisal mentioned that uh, even though we have data for uh, uh, eff efficient, eff uh, efficacy for other vaccines, the, the local vaccine, the Chinese vaccine are not um, um, studied enough. Why that's not happened, I'm not quite sure. But um, while uh, vac uh, boosters may be very important, revaccination may be important, additional vaccinations may be important, but we're discussing dessert when most people are hungry and for not even having had their initial meal. Um, less than 2% uh, of the low income countries have even had a single vaccine, while uh, America will be having their third uh, shot. So, so there is a, this is a question of equity also. Of course, it's a question of politics. It's a question of, of science or, 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 or lack thereof, of lack, lack of data, but it's also a question of, 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 of morality and ethics and what is the responsibility of the world leaders as the WHO keeps on saying, and it has gone horse saying that this is a global problem and let, unless and until you think globally and save the globe, your little pockets will not really matter, even if you got your third or your fourth dose, because some variant will come from somewhere because they were not vaccinated and 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 uh, uh, cause devastation. But um, as I said, we we we've been examining the, the pandemic through through our forum in various different uh, uh, ways. And uh, every time we discuss something, and we've of course never come to a conclusion, we have another problem coming up. So two, we, two weeks later, I don't know what we'll be discussing, but these things keep, keep evolving. But the important thing is we are getting together and thinking about these things. And uh, there is a level of discomfort, even with the, 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 what we are doing and achieving fantastic things through SCOC in Pakistan and other countries also. We are setting examples. We are. Who would have thought a billion doses of, of of vaccine in Pakistan? Who would have thought that? But we've got that, and we've been doing that consistently. 
even then there is there is there are, there are, there are issues that are that required to be resolved and talked about and discussed. And as Natasha said, NCOC doesn't have an SSS. Maybe they don't need an SSS. They have their ears open and 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 um, uh, feelers out. They they, they 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 get their messages and there's always Twitter. So so with that, I think I'd like to thank everyone, uh, the, all the four panelists, Faisal, Kimantri, Faiza, and Sunil for for a fantastic talks and a discussion. We've had a good good um, a good audience. Everyone, thank you very much. It was a very nice or, an, a, international audience. We couldn't take all the questions, but we ran out out of time. So thanks, Natasha, for for handling this. And uh, till next time, inshallah, in two weeks. Inshallah. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank and you. goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Mootley. Bye-bye.